Good afternoon, everyone. This is Nancy Berger, and you are visiting my live stream, or maybe you're watching the recording. Uh, we do this every couple of weeks, so if you are joining, uh, you can always send questions ahead of time, and we'll cover them in the live stream. Today, I am joined by my one of my favorite guests, <laughs> Kathy Barron. Um, hey, Nancy. Kathy Barron of Women Who Podcast magazine and women who sarcast. She's just got a lot of things going on. So Kathy, go ahead and introduce yourself to our watchers. Well, it's great to be here, Nancy. Thanks for inviting me for this little chit chat. Um, I am the uh, founder and editor of Women Who Podcast magazine and the host of Women Who Sarcast podcast. And I actually am a uh, full-time employee of a particular institution that will not be named. Um, so I do have a full-time job as well as my creative project. So it's great to be here. Yeah. And you do creative pro you do my, Kathy's a great video editor. She does a lot of cool things for me. So we, we've had many great discussions about this actual topic, actually about prickly workplace dynamics. And we've had funny conversations about them, but also serious conversations. And it can be a really difficult thing to navigate. So today I thought we would talk about, you know, how, what do you do when you are working on a team or you're working with folks in the office and you don't have a great vibe or you just have, you know, difficulty, you know, in, in communicating with them, either they're a little bit edgy or you feel attitude or you, you just feel uncomfortable. So I thought it might be fun to start out by sharing a couple of real stories. So, Kathy, do you have any <laughs> any real life experiences in this space that you? Want no, to I have nothing. No, I'm you, kidding. You I have a plethora worker. of things. <laughs> a plethora. Okay. Yeah. Let's, yeah. So, let's... well, before I worked in this job, I worked in the grocery industry for 16 years. So it's definitely, and now I have a desk job. So it's definitely a different vibe and it was definitely a transitional period for me when what part of the growth like what part of the grocery industry so um i worked like at trader joe's and whole foods um in the stores mm -hmm. so i was uh assistant store um like one of them for trader joe's i was like a manager okay. and with whole foods i was also a manager so you were um, dealing with the public Yes. The okay. customers are yes. always right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yeah. And, and that part was actually, you learn a lot about the human soul when you're in customer service. And, yep. uh, you know, I think even within customer service, it's different with grocery or retail, clothing retail. I think there's, you know, it's a whole different mm -hmm. animal, even within retail itself. Um, but I mean, as far as like in corporate jobs are definitely different from yes. that particular industry. Yeah, yeah. And you, yes. So you definitely are dealing with personalities within the office. You know, with a customer, you know, you can take care of them in 10 minutes and then they're gone. You know, with work place you know, yeah, with the co workers, yeah, you know, you're they're there. Project done or something. Yeah. yeah. They're there all the time. Yeah. So, you know, I think for me, um, definitely I go by people's vibes. You know, I'm a pretty easygoing person. So it takes a lot to rattle me or upset me. So if I'm upset or if I'm, you know, not having a good day, you know, it's something that's really bugging me. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, one of the things that I really liked about the grocery industry is that we were a team and it wasn't, you know, just for the sake of saying that mm -hmm. we were actually a team. We had each other's back. We covered each other. Um, and it was actually felt like a team dynamic. Yeah. Since moving into this new corporate job, it's very lacking in the team Feeling. And it doesn't have to be. It, it's no, not, it doesn't. No. Right. It's not by virtue of the fact that it's a corporate environment, but in this particular corporate environment. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and I think I think they want it to be. 
and I think they're trying a little too hard, you know, like with the whole family kind of concept and, you know, that doesn't really work for me. It doesn't really work, period. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about that for a minute because that's a really great point. So if a, if a workplace is trying to cultivate uh, a, a team-based environment and connective tissue among the team, um, using the metaphor of family and saying, well, we're a family. Uh, so, th so therefore we are, we have each other's backs. It's actually counterintuitive. So what happens in that situation is there's expectation set and, and, and false expectations. It's not a natural, it's not an organic situation for the workplace culture. Uh, family comes with a lot of things you have to kind of swallow hard on because they're family. It sets expectations about boundaries. Well, so what are the boundaries? Are there boundaries? Can we talk about everything? And it's not to say that bringing your personal life into work is a bad thing necessarily, but saying we're like a family sets an expectation that that's okay. And maybe not everyone is comfortable with that. So it comes with a lot of mixed messaging and it can be actually destructive rather than creating, you know, connective tissue. Well, definitely the boundary part of it, because there's been a time, you know, when I go, get, go into this new job, I'm very much a team player. You know, I take the initiative, I create things, I volunteer for projects, you know, because I want to be involved in part of the team, yeah, quote unquote. And so I didn't think about setting boundaries when I first walked in. And that was a huge mistake because mm. a year later, two years later, I'm needing to set these boundaries because of what has been previously created. And it's hard to do then. And yeah. And then now I'm like pushing back. I'm being accused of pushing back or, you know, um, doing whatever I want. Um, and so... And these are boundaries that I'm taking care of myself. It's not that mm -hmm. I'm being rebellious or defiant. Right. You know, I'm basically just setting a boundary and saying, no, I can't do that. And it's difficult to pedal backwards in that situation. So do you, do you have the conversation to address it? How, like, how do you navigate that? Um. I mean, well, I've heard that I was called those things by a third party, so I didn't hear it directly from my immediate supervisor. And that's the thing that happens quite a bit within this dynamic is that, you know, it's always secondhand, which, you know, with that, I need to take that with a grain of salt as well because, mm -hmm. you know, and who the person is that tells me. Because maybe they're just stirring up stuff to get me wound up, you know, sort of thing. But, right. um, but like, why don't we, like, let's just say, use it as an example and kind of role play a little bit. So if you were, if you heard something secondhand, a, a perception of you and it concerns you, like, how would you go about broaching it with your direct um, if, if you, if it was concerning to you and you wanted to kind of clear the air, how can you see yourself, you know, broaching it? And if so, how? Um, yeah, I think I would, um, if I trusted that my immediate boss would be open to the discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, they're under a lot of pressure and, we don't really see each other much or mm -hmm. even talk to each other. Um, so it's hard to create that time to have that discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and I also feel that since, you know, I've started making those boundaries, the dynamic between me and my immediate supervisor has changed. Mm -hmm. And because before it seemed to be a lot better um, as far as being able to communicate and, you know, they are listening, but I think that shifted and I think COVID did that. So, so it sounds like it's kind of building a little bit, like there's been a building of 
whatever it is, but there's a different uh, energy and it could, it feel, sounds like it feels a little. A little like, strained. Yeah. Strained. So, yeah. and I feel like in the past when I've brought up something to them, it's more of, um, they get defensive or, mm. um, it just doesn't sit well. Right. So, so I am hesitant to bring, to bring up topics. Yeah. Which then perpetuates itself. So I think for our listeners benefit, it would help to kind of address this. So if, if you're in a situation where, uh, you're feeling a strain in a, in a, in a, um, dynamic with someone else in the workplace, and it seems to be building, um, the, the plan of avoiding it, um, sometimes feels the best, but actually it, it will just create more either misunderstanding or more strain. So I might suggest in those kinds of situations to make a, an appointment to have a sit down, either virtually or face-to-face. Face-to-face is obviously always better for these kinds of things, but if you can't do it, a virtual sit down and just set aside, you know, a 15 minute meeting and say, listen, I, you know, I'm noticing uh, X, Y, Z. I'm noticing either, I mean, fill in the blank, you know, um, feeling a little strain in our communication, noticing that we don't have many um, connection points throughout the week, noticing whatever it is that you're noticing, Mm -hmm. because then you're not putting the other person on the the defensive at all. You're just saying what you're noticing. And I'd like to talk about it, or I'd like to clear the air because I'm feeling that whatever it is, but it's a 10 minute, 15 minute discussion that can take the air out of the balloon a little bit and calm things down. Like have, what do you think about that, Kathy? Yeah. I mean, that sounds great. And I, I think it's, I think to understand, um, how the other person communicates um, is also important Mm -hmm. um, because normally I just go in there and be like, okay, this is, this is the problem. You know, I don't like, Hey, how's it going? What you doing? I don't do that first. And I think my immediate supervisor likes to do that first just to kind of check in. And so I think if I go in that way and you know, be all surfacey first and then dig into meet them where they are. That, yeah. That's what you're saying. And that's important meeting yeah. them where they are so that you can build a bridge, you know? Exactly. Um, yeah. And, and that works both ways. They have to uh, acknowledge how you communicate. And so maybe the, the niceties don't last for five minutes. They last for one and then they yes. meet you where you are. So it, but the more you do it, the more of that, you know, understanding you can build and, and also like feedback, you know, making feedback part of the culture instead of it being, you sit down with them once every six months or a year. So I'd like to give some feedback is Mm -hmm. a beautiful opening statement, you Mm -hmm. know, for how we can do things differently here. I think that sometimes we just shy away from doing these things because we think we assume it's going to cause a uh, disruption when actually it can ultimately, maybe the first few times it'll feel a little weird, but it can ultimately lead to a lot stronger uh, communication style in the workplace. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, since COVID everybody's in their office with their door closed and, you know, I, it's, you know, the, the open door policy might be there, but it's figuratively and, you know, so I think that makes it a little difficult, you know, as well. It does. Because a lot of people aren't in the office. So, you know, running into them in the copier room or in, in the break room doesn't really happen. So it's harder to start those conversations, you know, um, organically. Yeah. And sometimes the whole weekly meeting paradigm is, um, it's an opportunity for that sort of thing, but often it, it doesn't, it doesn't bring that to the team because it, there's so many checklist items to go through. And sometimes something as simple as proposing that, you know, weekly meetings or team meetings or huddles or whatever it is you're doing, start with kind of a general check-in. 
it, it, it does double duty, right? It kind of lets people connect on a personal level before getting into the checklist, like just starting, starting the meeting with taking everyone's temperature. Give us uh -huh. a headline from your week. One headline could be personal, could be professional, could be anything, but one headline quick go around the room. And then it gives people kind of an idea of where everyone else is. It could be, you know, I just lost, lost my pet or, you know, or I just, uh, I, I'm, you know, my kids are visiting, you know, something that lets people know where everybody else is. And that can set a really nice foundation. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, we do have one-on-ones every other week. Uh, if they are, I mean, they're very busy. So sometimes the meetings get canceled or, you know, they come in late or they only have like five or 10 minutes of the 30 minutes that we've scheduled. Wow. So that's a little off putting as well, mm -hmm. because then that gives me the feeling that, okay, well, I'm not important enough for them to take the time, you know, to actually like sit for 30 minutes and, you know, have the focus on the two of us, you know, the two so of us having you, a conversation. Do you register your displeasure with that? Or do you say, well, can we, can, can we schedule the remaining 25 minutes uh, in a few days? Or do you, what do you do with that? I kind of go along with it because I know how busy their schedule is. And, you know, they're basically back-to-back -back meetings all day long. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even know when they eat lunch, honestly. So it's just the type of uh, work environment that they perceive as okay for them. And I feel like basically the rest of us are kind of accommodating or riding that, that wave of having consecutive meetings and consecutive meetings. So. And, and, and I know, you know, this, like, I'm not telling you anything new, but that's kind of, that minimizes your, your role as, mm -hmm. Uh, as an employee and it also minimizes their role as, as a leader, you know, because the, the job of being a leader is to make sure that you, you know, you're, you're ensuring that everyone that you're leading can reach their potential um, and not having the one-on-ones that are scheduled is sending messaging that they may not even be aware they're sending. So it, 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 that's a good example of a situation where you may want to raise awareness, mm -hmm. even if it's, it seems like I'm noticing that we are never doing a full 30 minutes for the one-on-ones. And that could be because of your schedule. I'd like, like to talk about it and see if we can figure out a different way to do this. Yeah. See, that's, that's a statement of there's no judgment. There's no sarcasm. There's no, yes, it's just yeah. like, I really would love us to do this differently. How do you think we can do that? Yeah. Um, because otherwise, you know, you're accepting it, which sends a message. They're not doing it, which sends a message, but nobody's talking about it. Yes. It's hard though, because I feel like I step into that leadership role, being a, me a manager in other careers, you know, I, step into that manager role with my manager. And it's just like, you know, it's like being a parent to your parent, you know, it's like, it's hard to be in that position because it's like, you know, I'm the kid, you're the parent, you know? So it's like, I'm the employee, you're the manager. So I think for me, it's, I'm trying not to step into that, that right. role yeah. Boundaries, that right? technically yeah. is not mine. Yeah. So it's, it's a difficult balance for me. And do you work with other people that are at your level under this manager? <clears throat> How does that work in um, your hierarchy? There are others um, that are even like, I, want, I don't want to say below me, but they're at different positions mm -hmm. that aren't um, at the same level that have other supervisors. So... Um, so you're closest with this manager. Yeah. So the one-on-ones are important. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're critical. I think it, it not only kind of brings it together and, 
you know, like I said, I've been working remotely for a while now, so it's hard to have that face to face. Mm. Um, so it definitely helps. The one on ones definitely help with kind of bringing us together again and, and checking in and and you know because I'm I'm pretty much a I can work by myself. I can mm. take the initiative. I can. I'm fine working by myself. I don't need constant supervision to keep me working. Um, and so I think that also, I also feel like they think that allows them to just be like, well, Kathy's fine. You know, she works fine on her own. She doesn't need to be checked on, you know, unless something really bad happens, then she'll come to me kind of thing. So I think that's the kind of relationship we've kind of developed over the years. Right. And that's <clears throat> so, you know, speaking up when something's coming off the rails and then you don't have kind of the foundation of regular communication and feeling mm -hmm. like you're tracking each other, then that that can be problematic. Right. So there's, you know, there's so many. I think this is common, by the way. I think this is, you know, and it's based on kind of assumptions about how much people want to hear from us. But I think that if you set the, if you, if you model the behavior of, I want to communicate, I want to be open and I want to be honest about what's working and not working so we can all make things better and run more smoothly. That's a good thing. But I think a lot of people hesitate to do it because they don't want to be the the one that's mm -hmm. at the apple cart, but it's not really upsetting the apple cart because the status quo may not be any better. Right. Exactly. So it's like, why bother Nancy? <laughs> well, like somebody <laughs> asked me uh, not long ago. Well, so, you know, suppose I, say this stuff, you know, I, I, I schedule a meeting with my manager and I come and I'm just, but I'm just going to be complaining and whining and who wants to hear that? And I said, well, that's a problem when you're equating giving, you know, feedback with complaining and whining. It's look, there's ways to say things. As I always say, you know, you don't want to walk into a meeting and start you know, put them on the defensive by saying, well, you did this and you did that. And I didn't like this. And you did that. You know, that's okay. Mm -hmm. So basic communication skills need to be employed, right? You know, constructive. So, and you don't send this stuff in emails, <laughs> you know, you, <laughs> you, you, or, or you, you schedule a face-to-face -face meeting and you, and if it's not possible, a virtual a zoom, whatever, a teams, whatever. So you can see the other person's face and you have an open and honest conversation about what is working and what's not working. When you kind of strip it down and think about it that way, it's, it, it's very different than, Oh, I'm just going to go, you know, complain for 15 minutes. If yeah. something's bothering you, it's worth raising, but in a constructive way. Well, a previous manager always said to me, if you have a problem, come with a solution. And in some ways, that's a good thing to think about when you go into a meeting that you aren't happy about a certain thing. Right. And just say and have a, you know, propose a solution or a different way of doing it and and see what happens. And I think that if the manager is open to that, then it shouldn't be a problem. But that's and, the thing. It's like, yeah. you know, if you're if you're up against a leader that isn't necessarily a leader and isn't open to hearing anything, then, you know, start looking at the want ads because nothing's really going to change. <laughs> yeah. And if you, and it may be a complex problem and you're not sure how to address it, but you can always say, I would like to brainstorm with you some ways we could do this differently. Mm -hmm. It applies to every possible situation because sometimes, you know, we don't know all the factors that are at play and what, you know, it's kind of like if you change one thing in the ecosystem, you may mess everything else up. So as the leader, you can say to them, I would love to brainstorm ideas or with the team. I'd like to talk about or hear everyone's ideas about how we might do this differently. I mean, that's that works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is somebody cutting a tree in your. Oh, my God. There's so many trees down on my street. 
They've been working on that tree next door for like two weeks. It was it's, huge. Uh, well, yeah. Kathy's in California. So you, you, you've had some, you've had some weather. It was pretty windy yesterday too, which was a little concerning. Um, but no, a couple weeks ago, a huge tree next door to me fell over into the street. So yeah, it's, it's a, a big deal. Or in, it's a good thing in, it didn't go towards the house. Cause that, that was, that would, we would be doing this in a, well, well, not my house, the next door neighbor's house. Okay. I was going to say, we'd be doing this a little differently today. Um, uh, so before we, we have a few more minutes, I wanted to, because it's you, we have to talk about sarcasm. It's like <laughs> sarcasm is. So this comes up a lot, and I've heard questions about this quite often. And I think sometimes people just don't know how to navigate it. Um, and it let's face it, you know, it's kind of, it can become a coping skill, a defense mechanism. It's just something people do because they don't want to really lean in and deal with an issue. So what, how do you, what do you feel about sarcasm in the workplace and how do you navigate it? Well, I think sarcasm, I think it depends on the delivery and the deliverer and how it's, you know, how it's used. Obviously, if you're going to jab somebody at work, that's not okay. Um, uh, I, it's hard. It's hard to say because sarcasm is part of my humor. And so yes. I don't know if that's an excuse. I'm sure people will be like, well, that's an excuse. And yes, yeah, sarcasm can be biting if you allow it to be. Um, but I think for me, sarcasm is also about um, stating the obvious. Yeah. You know, when... I can't think of an example right now, but I do no. use it occasionally. I've actually toned it down a lot because I think, um, I think at first people were thought it was funny, but as time went along, I think it kind of didn't go over very well. So, um, you know, I think that's another thing with this position is I feel like I've been hushed a lot as far as, um, saying things in meetings and bring, cause I say things that people are thinking and I'm not afraid to speak up and it's not, and when I speak up, it's not sarcastic necessarily. It's more of bringing things to the forefront that mm -hmm. others are afraid to bring. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not afraid to do that. And so I think, yes, sometimes I need to work on my delivery but at the same time, sometimes I feel in order to get that particular topic attention, I need to bring it in a certain way. Yeah. You know, so, you know, as far as sac sarcasm, I think it just depends on. Yes, I agree. You know, how it's used and where it's used. You know, if it's used in meetings to kind of lighten up, you know, that if it's sure. too heavy, if yeah. it's too tense, you know, sometimes I'll bring a little levity into it. And it's just like, y'all are taking this thing too serious. You know, this isn't rocket science. Yeah, you know, no, you know, I, the, I agree. It, it's a know. great, it's a great vehicle for humor and it's a great way to lighten things up. It, it's where it's placed and how it's placed. So if you're, you know, like in a review with a direct report and you say something sarcastically about their performance, that's a no go, right? Mm -hmm. Because it you it's not a clear way to communicate, and it is a way to couch anger and um, passive aggression. So uh, it, that's not. But if you are, you know, it's just you know team the team huddle and everybody's you know sharing something funny about their week, you know. So it depends on how you you do it. But you, the point you made, I don't want to lose sight of it about being the one in the room who states, you know, who uh, identifies the elephant. Um, that's a powerful position. And if that's handled the right way, and it sounds like you, you've become increasingly self-aware about how you do that, that can be something that's highly valued by your team and, and people depend on you to do that. And if it's upsetting the apple cart and ruffling feathers because people want to keep the elephant in the room, you know, then it, it's, it's a good skill to hone. Okay. If you're kind of like the self-proclaimed, I'm going to cut through all the stuff and say what everyone is thinking and, and you, you hone that skill, it can be really valuable to the management, to leadership, to the vision of the company. 
You would you think know? so. Yeah. 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 And um, so it's just, you know, and that's not a great place to play sarcasm, but, um, but a, a, a way to say like, I would just like to raise something and wondering if anyone else is, is feeling this also, you know, so they, you can couch it in a way you can present it in a way that it doesn't mm. get people off. It's not as off putting. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's really a brave thing to do. And, and people probably really respect you for doing that. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I know this is a really piss poor attitude to have, but it's like, I don't really care, you know, how people are going to react because I think it's, uh, something that needs to be brought up and, you know, it's, it's either I've seen it or I've heard other people talk about it in other circles and, you know, and like I said, it's all about the timing and where you bring it up. And, so. and it's, and it's also, it's not great that it's, you're at that point where you don't care. So you say the thing, Yeah, but that's also important information for you. So goes back to, well, maybe it's because I'm not having my one-on-ones and maybe it's because I never get mm. to see anybody. And maybe it's because I feel like, you know, I'm being hushed a little bit. So there's, there's awareness that can go on around that. And it's important to notice that. And then, you know, maybe have that conversation. I, mean, I, I feel like in the meetings, I, I'm going to say the thing everyone's thinking because I just don't feel like there's enough community. See what I mean? Like it's all yeah. interconnected. So sure. I think it's important for people when you're feeling, when you're feeling prickly workplace dynamics, there's a reason <laughs> for it. And stuffing it down is not the answer. Being passive aggressive and sarcastic in professional discussions is not the answer. What is usually a good answer is to keep track, be self-aware of what's in, under your skin and raise these issues in a professional and measured way in a face-to-face -face with your manager or how, whoever it has to be. But, you know, not saying anything. And then one day you just throw up Explode. your hands and say, forget it, I'm leaving. Yeah. That's, that's a, that can be an unfortunate way to do it. But yeah, no, I agree with that. What a great discussion. We They're always great them. with you, Nancy. We could do another. We could go on two. the road. Yeah, hit the road. <laughs> Food truck and sarcasm. That's what we should. Do. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> you coming over here, or you want me to come over there? <laughs> Either way, we'll meet in the middle. Um, if uh, anyone uh, has questions that you'd like, um, you would like to be addressed in these live streams, just shoot me an email. You can find me across social. If you haven't taken a look at Women Who Podcast Magazine, and you are a podcaster. Highly recommend. Reach out to Kathy. She uh, she does all sorts of cool things. And and what's going on with your podcast? Are you still doing it? So Women Who Sarcast podcast is still going. And you can check out my sarcasm. Just you know, get a flavor of it by listening to the episodes uh, anywhere you listen to podcasts. Yeah, it's great. And she has great guests. It's really fun. So thank you. Because you're one of them, Nancy. You're I one am. of my great guests. I am. It's always fun. So thank you for joining me today. And everyone will see you next time on Ask Nancy Livestream. Be well and uh, talk to you soon.